Now let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you right now because you're a great God. We thank you because we call this church to dream big. And we believe, Father, that in this, in this, this change as far as growth within our lives, God, you're stretching our capacity. You're stretching our platform of influence. And we believe, God, you're raising up the right people in the right time, in this right moment to do your will. God, we, you, we know that you bless this church with amazing pastors. By the same time, God, you're raising up amazing leaders here to, to not only just to win their community, God, but to win their city. We thank you, God, for this word. Let our hearts be open, let distractions cease. And we know, God, that you have a word for us. Be with us here this morning. And God's people say, amen, amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time for Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Amp. If you were to put a title to this message here this morning, it's called Out With The Ordinary. Out With The Ordinary. I don't know about you, but I think a lot of times change comes through parenting. Uh, I just recently had a, my kids dance. They dance hip hop. We had them in part of hip hop dance for a lot of years. And just recently I got to go watch my babies battle. That's battle dance, break dance. And uh, it's amazing to see how good they are getting. And I think one day they're going to dance on stage at Victory Arch International Advance. And God's called them to do that type of thing. But I learned a valuable lesson about a month ago, a month and a half ago, that really challenged me to grow. My babies were dancing, and I got to, to really see my Bella perform. My Bella, she's, uh, she's my middle child. Uh, she's, she lights up my world. Uh, she, she, she's so sweet and sensitive, and I love my baby Bella. And she's, she's younger in that, in that uh, dance company, and she's battling the best dancer in the company. 16-year-old, 17-year-old girl, she's sick. You know, she's awesome at dancing. And my baby, they draw her name out, and she has to battle the best dancer in the company. So I'm hoping that my battle goes first so that that girl doesn't kill my baby's confidence. Lo and behold, the big girl goes first. And my baby's right there watching her, and I can see, like, fear in her eyes, but at the same time, she knows what she's about to do. My baby's a good dancer. So the girl goes and dances, everybody's cheering, and then my Bella's turn to go, and she dances. And I, I, I know that she's worried, but she knows what she's doing, and she does good for, for how much she knows. And as she's walking off the, the, the stage, everybody's cheering for her. There's moms even crying for her because she showed a, a, a lot of confidence and courage in that moment. But right when Bella got to me, she started crying. And it broke my heart because I go, why are you crying, baby? You know, I'm trying to tell her that she's, I go, you're, you're good. She's 16. You're seven, you know. Uh, imagine when you're 16 how good you're going to be. And I try to fill my baby with confidence. And I can see her. She, I go, do you want to stay here? She's like, I'll stay. And then Mylene goes in battles, and Mylene kills it. She's my oldest. She kills it. She wins her battle. And, and I'm, I'm telling her, Lini, great job. You did what you, you know how to do. But later on that evening, we went to a baby shower, and I found myself wanting to encourage Bella being a dad. And I, I remember we were sitting in the car, and I was telling Bella, Bella, you're going to be the greatest dance in the world one day. And I'm feeding her spirit. I'm feeding her courage. But at the same time, my Angelina is listening to me tell Bella. We get home. Angelina's crying, and I asked her, I go, Angelina, that's my oldest, I go, what's wrong? And she told me, how come you never tell me that I'm going to be the best? I thought I was being a good dad, you know, like I'm encouraged my middle baby, but I thought my older baby was strong. And she said, why don't you tell me I'm going to be the best in the world? Why don't you tell me I'm, and I started, man, I go, man, I started crumbling as a dad, like I'm seeing my oldest child breaking because I'm not taking care of my responsibility as a dad. And I remember God began to speak to me. He says, as a leader, it's easy to notice the obvious. When someone's in pain, when someone needs encouragement, when someone needs strength. But what about the one that knows how to handle situations? What about the one that know how to fight with courage? So I'm going to tell you, Victory Arch Manchester here this morning. God knows what you've been going through, and God approves of you. God loves you. God will strengthen you. 
We thank you for your hard work backing up Pastor Paul and Sister Vicky. You may go unnoticed sometimes. You may feel like that sometimes. But God notices you. And I remember that was a hard lesson because I had to sit there in my living room and I started thinking of all the leaders that I was like, man, they're tough enough. And, and I might encourage the one that's always broken visibly, but I don't encourage my right hand, my left hand man, the people that are there. So I started sending them text messages, thanking them for their hard work, thanking them for their sacrifice. And all of a sudden we started creating something called a chemistry and a health within our church. And I believe the same thing that is here, that God is going to raise up a church with chemistry that knows how to work hard together, that can battle together. How many can say amen? Come on, how many can say amen? Out with the ordinary. That means that sometimes we have to change. That means that God's going to propel us to do something great within our life. In James chapter 2, Verse 26, it says, faith without works is dead. I've been able to talk to a lot of young leaders, ministry workers, and church leaders in the ministry. And they all know what it is to burn plows. To set out and live for God, but sometimes it's hard for them to figure out what they're going to do next. They prayed and made a commitment, and then sometimes we get stuck. As a leader, I, I've seen it over and over again as a man of God, uh, uh, trying, to, trying to pursue the plan of God. And I experienced it, but I also experienced moments of being stuck. If you've ever been stuck before, wa wave your hand at me. If you've ever been stuck. Like, man, I'm trying to grow, but then you seem like you can't grow past it. I don't know about you, but I start a diet every January 1st, and I seem to break it the second week. Come on now. <laughs> or we... we do how, or we could, we say, well, I'm going to cut these people off because they're unhealthy for me. Then we find ourselves back in that same circle. Or there's certain things that we want to do, but then all of a sudden it's hard for us to keep doing them. So we go in this vicious cycle. There's two major reasons why, why well-intentioned people like us get stuck after we burn our plows. The first thing is we don't think big enough. The second thing is we don't start small enough. A lot of times people want to have big dreams, but they don't know where to start. Well, I want to have a big ministry, but you don't know how to do a life group yet. Or I, 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 want, I, want, I want to reach my city, but we haven't reached our community. I, 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 want to, I, want, I want to be a leader of leaders, but we don't come to all services. Hello. I want to make an impact, but we don't disciple. I want to do these things. We can have all the dreams in the world, but if we don't know where to start, where we start in the, in the places where there's no recognition, we start in the places and say, God, you could use my life. You could do something small in me so I could become big one day. Some of you, God has given dreams that you've left out and said, you know, what? I, I can't do that for the simple fact that we don't know where to start. But some of you, I'm telling you here this morning, your dream is going to waken up once more, one more time where you could be on this stage singing worship. How many can say amen? You could learn an instrument and begin to play a part of this worship team. You could be a preacher. God wants to do something great here this morning. How many can say amen? Dream big, but start small. Dream big, but start small. Thinking big enough and starting small enough are the two sides of the same coin. So I just don't want to motivate you to dream bigger for your life. I also want to challenge you to take realistic steps of obedience that it can actually make God's vision for your life come to pass. I think sometimes that some of us don't think big enough about who God is. And what he wants to do in our lives. I was an ex-drug addict for four years of my life. From 15 to 19, I was smoking a drug called methamphetamine. I never thought I would be in the place I am today. But it's only because of God and his grace that he put us on a journey for me to marry my beautiful wife. To have three beautiful little girls. To help in one of the best churches in Arizona. To be a part of a ministry. Like I didn't think my of myself that way but God's plans were not how we seen ourselves it's how he sees us how many can say amen so no matter where you're at today God can see you do something greater than what we can ever imagine who says you have to be a community church who says you can't be a city church 
A lot of times we, we try to define our churches by our community. Yes, we reach our community, but I believe Victory Outreach Manchester is a city church. How many can say amen? Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands for Jesus here this morning. Come on, if you really believe that, someone shout hallelujah here this morning. How God wants to make you have an influence in the city. Not just in your community. But you got to dream big and you got to start small. In Ephesians 3.20 it says, Our God is able to do immeasurably more than what we ask for or we imagine. Our God is our provider. Our God is a promise keeper. Our God is a healer. Our God is our sustainer, our fortress, our strong tower. I don't know about you, but I just didn't experience God just to get saved or rescued. God has been good to me. How many can say amen if he's been good to you? You see, but a lot of times the things that we face in our life change our perspective. And all of a sudden our perspective begins to change. And it doesn't mean that God's changed on the other side of our perspective. It means the way we see him has changed. You see, our God is the same God on the other side of that problem. How many can say amen? But we just have to get a clear, a clear perspective of what he is to our life. In our church, we have a lot of people getting hit with cancer, hepatitis, and cirrhosis of the liver. But we're a church that believes in miracles. And in our church last year, we were able to document miracles that happened in our church. Where three of our kids gang teachers were diagnosed with cancer. And we were able to say today that our three teachers are healed by the blood of Jesus. How many can say amen? People that walk into our recovery homes with cirrhosis and hepatitis. They go to their doctors after a healing service. And the, the doctor says, I don't know what happened, but, but you don't have hepatitis no more. You don't have cirrhosis of the liver no more. Why? Because there's a people that know how to dream big but start small. Believing God for miracles. You see, what if, what are you dreaming for this morning? If I were to ask you yourself, what are you dreaming for this morning? My brother in the gray suit, what are you dreaming for this morning? Revival. Revival. What are you dreaming for this morning? Big things. Name a few. <laughs> a big home. Okay, there we go. A big home. You, you know why specifics are important? For the simple fact that you could, because God likes specific prayers. Because he gives attention to detail. Well, I want a big home. Well, how many rooms do you want? I don't know about you, but Germany just opened up a, a 20 plus room facility. How many can say amen? They're dreaming big, but they started small in that small little prayer room. And then God opened up a, a mini mansion for recovery in Germany. Why? Because it was a people that knew how to dream big, but they knew how to start small. We're celebrating in our church that we just we have a 17-bedroom facility for our recovery home, and we just paid it off. Hallelujah. Come on. We just paid it off. We don't owe nobody nothing. It's, our, it's in our name now. This last February, we paid it off. Why? Because in, 19, in the early 90s, we dreamed big, but we started small. And now we have some place to call our own home where we're not renting, we're not leasing, we're not paying the mortgage, but it's ours. And I believe that could be the same thing here. Well, we dream big, but we start small. How many can say amen? You see, here this morning, you got to take what you're dreaming and you got to put specifics to it. You got to put action to it. It can't be too far-fetched where our, our actions today won't, it won't be a part of what, the, what the, the details is for our future. And I believe that this morning that your pastor is dreaming for a bigger building. If we want, when we walk in the first service, it, it, you guys wouldn't even fit in one service if you tried, if you tried to. That's why you need a place of 30,000 square feet, 25,000 square feet, where you'll, you'll be able to fit 800 seats just in the sanctuary and have a kids gang sanctuary and have an area where you can hang out and eat and have a reception hall. I, I'm trying to dream big for your church. You see, if God is your partner, make your plans big. If God is your partner in your life, make your plans big as possible. But it's going to take a lot more than just dreaming to see them become a reality. That's why some of us, we have to give attention to the way we give to the Lord. 
where we're not just 10% or even 15%, but then we begin to give 20% and, and begin to say, God, I'm partnering with you in my finances. And if we're partnering with God in our finances, then we have heaven's overflow. I want heaven's overflow in my life. I don't need my overflow. I need God's overflow. Because when God's overflows in our life, then all of a sudden there's something that called favor that comes upon us. We get things that we don't deserve. How many can say amen? And it's for the simple fact that we're tapping in to the promise. But we have to be willing to think big. Tell your neighbor, think big. Come on, say it loud. Say, think big. You see, a young boy grew up in a good home, but he made wrong choices. His environment got the best of him. His story had a chapter that he thought would never end. He was drug addicted, hopeless, and he felt like he didn't have a way out. He was a junkie who couldn't dream past a needle. Even with having run-ins with the law, being locked up, it looked like he'll never shake this demon. Then one day, grace found him. Through a man who never stopped believing that God's word was true. Three miracles aligned that day. A country boy, a drug addict, and a gang member found themselves under one roof praising a king and never forgetting his promises. This story is so interesting because who would have thought through a small prayer of a godly woman, the relentless pursuit of a young preacher, and the brotherhood that will last a lifetime that this young man was being set up by God to change the world. This young man is our founder, Pastor Sonny Argazzoni. Through seeking God and guidance of godly man, he fought for a dream to reach the most hurting people of the world. And it's crazy because 52 years later, we find ourselves in over 30 countries all over the world. How many can say amen? Come on, how many can say amen? Dr big dreams start small. I can imagine this when the realtor got with him about that building on Glass Street. When they're making arrangements for payment of that lease, when that realtor gave Pastor Sonny that key, he didn't know he was not only giving him a key to a small church there on Glass Street, but that realtor was giving Pastor Sonny the key to the inner cities of the world. So when he opened up that door, there was dreams behind that door. There were cities behind that door, but it first started off in Glass Street. And now we have churches in England. Now we have churches in Holland. Now we have churches in South Africa. Now, come on, now that's something to give God praise about. It was a big dream that started small. He didn't see it happening right away, but all of a sudden, when the door opened up, God says, now because you have that type of faith, I'm going to give you the inner cities of the world. How many can say amen? Did it come easy? Of course not. Boy, he didn't realize that opening the door of that small church through the obedience of the call that God has placed on his life, he would be opening up the inner cities of the world. One turn of a key unlocked the inner cities. Through that turn of a key, it unlocked Europe. Think about it. Who would have accepted people like you and I? Who would have believed in individuals? I don't know about you, but I know nobody would have believed in me because they did it before. I grew up in the church. I'm a PK. My dad's a pastor. My granddaddy's a pastor. He started the church in 1985. My dad took over in the year 2000. I moved to Phoenix in 2006, and, and now I'm a pastor. My kids are fourth-generation PKs in this ministry. But when I, was in this, when I was in the streets, no other church came looking for me. And there was opportunities for other churches to come look for me. I would even go visit a Spanish church. I didn't even know Spanish. I will visit a Spanish church just to see if they'll reach out to me. And it, 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 and it was crazy because we had a crazy men's home director named Earl. And Earl would always seem to find me. The dope house, the alleyway, the liquor store. And he'll always seem to find me. And I said, God, I don't know why, but it didn't take the preaching of my dad. It didn't take the preaching of my grandfather. It took a love of an individual that said, I will not stop pursuing you until I see you serving Jesus. And that man was from Victory Outreach. How many can say Amen. Come on, how many can say amen? You could be anywhere else, but God wanted you here. Why? Because he sent somebody from Victory Outreach to come and share the gospel with you and to give you hope. Faith is in a state of mind. It's a course of action. Faith is work. Three quick points on Elijah. 
Elisha. And this, I love this story because I want you to dream big but start small. Tell your neighbor, dream big but start small. Elisha had the ability to trust God for bigger things, more than anyone around him dared to believe. He looked at every obstacle as an opportunity. That says a lot about his mentality. It, when he faces things, if we face things and we see them more as obstacles, then we're looking through the wrong lens. But if we see it as an opportunity to get better, then all of a sudden God says, I'm going to increase your type of faith. To prove that God is greater than the confines of any situation. I don't know about you, but I've been through some hell. If you've been through some hell in your life, wave your hand at me. And you know what's crazy about this is you're waving your hand, but you're still here. You're still in this church. You're still getting up and saying, God, I know you have a plan for me. So the hell you've been through didn't break you. It actually made you. How many can say amen? Come on, how many can say amen? The things you've been through were only attached to your calling to make you better. You see, I believe here this morning, I believe this church has been through some heavy things. Why? Because there's a heavy calling behind what you've been through. Because God's going to raise this church up to do something mighty in the name of Jesus. How many can say amen? You see, Elijah just didn't believe it. He did something about it. Miracles are the divine result of small steps of faith-filled preparation. Human action prepares the way for a supernatural flow. In 2 Kings chapter 3, I want you to camp there with me. It's an interesting story, and we're going to go through it quickly for the sake of time. In 2 Kings chapter 3, it talks about King Jeroham. And it talks about how there are fighting an enemy and all the enemies came together to defeat them. In 2 Kings it says, Now Jeroham the son of Ahab became king over Israel at Samaria the 18th year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah and reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord not, but not like his father and mother because they put away sacred pillars of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless he persisted in the sin of Jeroboam the son of Nebat who then made Israel sin and did not depart from them. Now Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 101,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Everything was going good until that king passed away. And then they try to take him over. And what's interesting about this story is King Jeroham was ruling over Israel when the kingdom was divided. The king of Moab, they, they, they joined together to create a rebel force. Then King Jeroham seek help from the kings of Judah and Edom. And where there was help, where they should have been defeated by the enemy, all of a sudden the, the kings of Israel came and locked hearts together. So they said, all together we could defeat this army. And what's crazy about this story is that when they got together, they said, well, well we have enough rations for this war. But in the few first days, they drank all the water. Tell your neighbor, they drank all the water. Come on, say it loud. Say, they drank all the water. So they're looking for a solution in their crisis. A lot of times we come to God only in our crisis. When things are falling apart, when things seem like, man, I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I do know this, that God can come through for me. So the kings were seeking advice from each other. Then one of the kings says, let's go to this godly man because, because he, he, he seeks the Lord and, and he has favor from God. And let's hear from him. It's funny because they're going through this thing and they're, they ran out of water and they're preparing to face a dangerous enemy while facing another threat, dying of thirst. King Jeroham was looking for a solution, but he wasn't desperate for God. You see, King Jehoshaphat sought after a man connected to God. And what happened was when they brought him to Elijah in verse 14, they came in their Cadillacs, they came with their horses and chariots, they came with the best of the best, but Elijah says, I am not impressed. Why? Because you're coming to me with, 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 with pride, you're coming to me with all these things, but what you need to do is, is you need to seek the Lord. And what he tells this guy, he says, go get me a harp. It's funny, they're in a dying situation, but Elijah says, go get me a harp. That's why worship is important. He says, before we seek an answer, let's worship the one who gives the answer. 
You see, a lot of times we come before God in a, in a, in a season of crisis, but there's no worship behind our want. You see, I don't know about you, but I've been in a place where sometimes our pride gets the best of us. And we say, well, I can make it. I'm strong. I'm a man. I could do this. But then what we really need to do is we need to come to this altar and seek God and say, God, I need you in this situation. God, I need you to speak to me. God, I need your insight. God, I just want to tell you how good you've been to me. Because without you, I wouldn't be able to fight here today. How many can say amen? Come on, how many can say amen? You see, some of you here today are going to get your breakthrough in this church for the simple fact that you're going to turn your worship up. And as you turn your worship up, your problems will begin to cease for the simple fact that you're seen through a different perspective. How many can say amen? amen? You see, this morning we're talking about King Jeroham. He was looking for a solution, but he wasn't desperate for God. Elisha says, I am not oppressed. The enemies were armies were in despair, and they're waiting for an answer. But Elisha asked for a heart. With worship, the word begins to flow. He says, Water will flow, but first you have to make a, ba a valley full of ditches. It's funny because God, God says, I have the water, but you prepare the way. I have, I have, I have the water. But you'll determine how much water that you keep. Some of us want a miracle and we're doing a foot of digging. And we expect God to pour out his reign of favor, but we're not doing the work in our digging. Well, I want to do something big for the Lord. And we dig a six-inch hole, a foot hole. He says, we don't need you just to scrape the ground. We need you to dig ditches. See, some of you, your problems will cease when you begin to dig. Because all of a sudden, his rain will come down on you. And you have the joy and you have the peace that surpasses all understanding for the simple fact that you put in work for your breakthrough. How many can say amen? You got yourself up this morning, says, I got to find myself in church for the simple fact that I know where my power comes from. How many can say amen? Somebody got to shout glory here this morning because you've been digging and no one's been looking. But that's all right because our God in heaven knows what you've been doing on the background of things. How many can say amen? man you say God I want favor and he looks at your ditch and says watch I'm gonna put an overflow for your life water will flow but first make a valley full of ditches why would anyone dig ditches for rain that's not in the forecast because that's the way faith works when you know God has promised you greater things, you won't wait for a sign to appear before you respond. There's greater things for this church, but are you willing to dig the ditch for it? Are you willing to dig ditches for your city? Ditches for the drug addict, for the gang member? Ditches for those that are, that are oppressed by opiates or those that are... are, are just, on a journey going aimlessly away from the Lord. They're going down the road of Joppa, but they're going far from God's presence in Tarsus. See, a lot of us, we need to understand this. The road of obedience in our life may not look like the beautiful road, but it's the best road. But you got to dig ditches. Tell your neighbor, dig ditches. Come on, say it loud. Say, dig ditches. It's just as if... God says, if you really believe I'm going to do what I told you to do, get busy. If you really believe the promise I have for you, then get busy. Tell your neighbor, get busy. Come on, say it loud. Say, get busy. It's like him saying, show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. Do your part. If you will do what I ask you to do, I'll be faithful to my word. If you dig ditches, I will bring the rain. Digging in the night. It's not the most popular thing to do, but someone got to do it. It's like this. It's like the, the, it says, go to every man and give them a shovel. And no one sees what you're doing. But the, th the simple fact is this. You're not doing it for man's recognition. You're doing it for the attention of God. So don't be mad if you don't get applause for your ditch that you're digging when no one sees it. Why? Because when someone sees the overflow from what's taking place in your life, they'll know what you did behind the scenes before the rain came. How many can say amen? See, some of you are like, ah, they don't know what I'm doing. It's good because then your heart stays pure. 
because every, everybody knew what you were doing. Some people might start hating on you, and you can't deal with haters because you got a little anger problem. Hello. So it's good that you're digging ditches in the dark. It's good that you're putting your work in when no one sees you. Why? Because then pride could come up and all of a sudden we can say, well, look what I'm doing. But no, no, no. It's not like what, what I'm doing. Look what God's going to do. How many can say amen? amen? You see, I believe in this church, God's going to raise up some powerhouse leaders that know how to dig in the night. That know how to dig when no one's around. That, can, that know how to dig when you can't see progress. We all want something to do great, but we have to start digging. How many can say amen? Going to the streets without a street team. Coming to pray when there's no prayer night. That's when people get the hold of God and say, look, I'm digging a ditch. That no one's seen. Because God is going to bring the rain. Tell your neighbor, God's going to bring the rain. Rain is God's specialty. But God has assigned a part to you. In Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Faith is a substance of things hoped for, but it's the evidence, evidence of things not seen. Can you dig when you don't see it or when you don't feel it? Can you dig when there's no clouds or there's no rain? It can be a lonely challenge to face when no one's supporting you, endorsing you, or you're telling you that you're doing a good job. But yet God is with you. If Pastor Ant could come and make his way. You see, these people knew how to dream big, but they also knew how to start small. They wanted to win a war, but God says, first, dig a ditch. Let me fill your thirst first before you go into battle. Let me anoint you first before you go wage a holy war. Let me, let me do something in this house before I give you a bigger house. Let me build you up as a leader now before you start making big moves later. Let me use you now in this church, in this hour, in this season, so I can promote you later on and it won't get to your head. So when you preach before thousands, your heart won't be turned. When you sing before thousands, your heart won't be turned. I don't know if you see what I see, but this is a call. You're, you're called to be a, a world-changing church. Where other Victory Arches are looking to you. To see how you're digging in the night. To see that flow, flow through you guys. We're a big church ourselves there in Phoenix. But you guys play a role in our lives. Because we know what you've been through. We know what happens in this church. But you also come, we're able to experience firsthand people that are still standing, people that are still fighting, people that are still moving forward, people that still have their shovels in their hands. And even if the whole world can't recognize it, they'll recognize the reservoir when the, when the power begins to flow. You see, people may not give you credit now, they may not give us credit now, but they'll know how much weight we hold when the, when the morning comes and they see a reservoir here in Manchester, or they see a reservoir here in Europe, where no one will say, well, it's not, no, we all came together and we put our hands to the plow to see our city saved. Why? Because we got a big dream. Tell your neighbor, a big dream. Come on, say it loud. Say a big dream. But we know how to start small. We're not too big for the small things. We're not too big for kids gang. Hello. We're not too big for the nursery department. We're not too big for the ushering. We're not too big for media or sound. We're not too big to host a life group. Why? Because we got a big dream that's worth it. We start small. We dream big. And I believe here in this church that God, the rain is coming. You may not see the cloud. You may not see, you might not hear the wind, but the rain is coming. That's God's specialty. God specializes in rain. God is with you, Victory Outreach Manchester. When everything seems far-fetched and the enemies continue attacking you, it's hard to keep our faith up and believe. But if you can hold on to this, Pastor Sonny dreamed big, but he started small. And today we have hundreds of churches throughout the world because of a man and woman that kept digging. They kept digging, not just for LA or for California, but they dug for Europe. 
They dug for Africa. They dug for South America. Come on, how many can say amen? We're a part of something great. How many can say amen? Come on, some of you got to clap here this morning. Come on, some of you got to shout here this morning. Come on, some of you got to give God glory here this morning. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout praise the Lord. Come on, somebody shout glory. Come on, shout aloud, say glory. Dream big, but start small. Let's all stand.